The Japanese occupation had virtually destroyed the Malayan railway system, in addition to hundreds of kilometers of track cannibalized for the death railway in Siam, a number of bridges were disassembled and sent to Sumatra, and two-thirds of the carriages were dispatched to Indochina. The British restored most of the system when they returned in 1945, and the final stage of this restoration was the delivery of 26 Class 20 English electric diesel locomotives in 1957 which happened to be the year when Madeka was declared and Malaya became independent, and also the year when I first arrived in Malaya. The Golden Blowpipe was the train service that had originally run from Gamas to Kota Baru, and in 1958, Malayan Railway were restoring it. It remained steam-driven, and I was invited aboard to cover the first journey for the Straits Times and Malay Mail newspapers. The management had generously offered me a return first-class ticket to its terminus at Kota Baru, plus free transportation in the goods van for my Lambretta scooter, so I could put it to use at my destination. But first I had to catch a connecting train south to Gumas, the rail junction at which the main Kuala Lumpur to Singapore line met the branch line to Kota Baru. Following this, I had to transfer to the waiting. Once settled aboard the blowpipe, as it got up steam, I went in search of the engine driver, a most obliging Chinese, who declared himself happy to have me ride with him on the footplate whenever I chose, and even proved willing to stop the train at photogenic locations en route. This placed in my hands an overwhelming privilege I could have seriously abused to the considerable de detriment of the operating timetable. I decided to employ it sparingly. Arrived at Kota Baru, I checked into a Chinese hotel and was conducted up a creaking iron spiral staircase to my room in which a mosquito net ballooned under a rotating fan in an ambitious attempt to occupy the entire space between the four walls. If Bantai Chintabrahi indeed lived up to its name, it must have done so in a manner not readily detectable to an orang pute, or white man, on a mechanical conveyance with a diminutive rubber t wheels that could obtain no proper purchase on the loose white sand. All I found there were the long, rakishly beautiful, polychromatic prows in which local fishermen ventured miles out into the exposed wastes of the South China Sea. Like fishermen in other parts of the world, they saw the sea as a feminine entity and never allowed women aboard their prows for fear of inciting the sea's jealous rage. So fearful were they of her wrath that when a storm brewed, they would drop their sarongs to expose their genitals and shame the storm into submission. I found a quartet of these fishermen assembled around the propped hull of one of their elegant vessels, across which a shelter of nipa palm was arranged to ward off the worst of the sun. They lay on the sand in the shade of its beam, chatting amiably while the tough coarsened soles of their bare feet scraped the wood as effectively as sandpaper. Others squatted nearby, using both fingers and toes with equal dexterity to mend their nets. I regretted that my rudimentary Malay was at that stage inadequate for conversation, for I wished to learn where on earth the beach had acquired its promising but seemingly undeserved sobriquet. I dined that night in the beachside officer's mess of fellow travellers I had met on the train from the police field force stationed near Kota Baru. They assured me that they found the local Kelantan dialect almost impossible to understand, but this was not surprising. Nearby was the beach where 5,300 Japanese troops had landed from three transport ships accompanied by warships that dropped anchor at approximately 10.20 p.m on December 7, 1941. 
Due to the time difference across the international date line, the attack on Kota Baru occurred one and a half hours earlier than the raid on Pearl Harbor, but British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill learned to the latter before he was informed that one of Britain's own colonial dependencies had been the first targeted for invasion. By 12.25 a.m. on December 8th, the enemy had virtually completed their landing at Kota Baru. Battle was commenced, producing some of the fiercest and bloodiest fighting of their entire advance down the Malayan Peninsula. My dinner hosts in the police field force arranged that before dawn the following morning we would embark on a chartered motor vessel to investigate for ourselves the marine life of the South China Sea. I spent the night as their guest to spare my scooter the long journey back into town. With the sun ascending in our eyes, we headed out across a rippling iridescence suffused with scintillating flashes of rubies, diamonds, and flecks of gold. We spent most of that day drinking crates of tiger beer and singing bawdy barroom ballads in both English and Malay. We were really almost too drunk to fish, but the fish surrendered themselves to us with profligate abandon. Whenever their numbers dwindled, our pawang, or fish detector, volunteered to submerge himself and pinpoint the nearest location of any promise. Good pawangs, with their uncanny ability to listen underwater and locate fish shoals at distances of several hundred meters, were even then few and far between. Ours was among the best. He would remain immersed for up to two minutes at a stretch, his submarine form readily detectable far below our hull seemingly oblivious to the twisting, striped necklaces of sea snakes as they swam by almost within arm's reach.